Good afternoon and welcome to today's IAC webinar, Fundamentals of Echo Artifacts. My name is Kelly Baer and I am the Creative Design Manager with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, use the questions tab located on the left side of your screen. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar as we will monitor questions throughout the presentation and try to answer as many as possible during the Q&A period. Also on the left sidebar, please note the resources tab. Click this tab for a link to today's handout, a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides. Select the file name to download the handout. Lastly, in the lower left of the player, please note the Request Support button. If you experience any technical problems during this webinar, click this button. A technical expert will be there to assist you with any issues you may have. For those who like to take notes during the presentation, look to the right of the slides and click the Notes tab. There you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for the ASE CEU credit, you must be registered, logged into this webinar, then complete the survey. The link to the survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. If you are viewing this webinar in a group, please be sure you are also individually registered and logged into this webinar on another computer or device so that we have record of your attendance today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. This webinar is a joint presentation of IAC and ASE. And now I would like to introduce today's guest presenter, Dr. William Lauer. Dr. Lauer specializes in cardiology and is certified in echocardiography, cardiovascular disease, and nuclear cardiology by the National Board of Echocardiography. He practices at the VA Pittsburgh Healthcare System and is affiliated with UPMC Heart and Vascular Institute, UPMC Presbyterian, and UPMC Passivant. He's a true expert in the field, and we are happy to have him with us today. And with that said, I will now turn this webinar over to today's speaker, Dr. William Lauer. Doctor? Well, thank you. Thank you, Kelly, very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and good morning to some of you. Um, it is a pleasure to join you today. I'd like to thank Katie Gibson from the Intersocietal Accreditation Commission for the invitation um, to be with you today to discuss the fundamentals of echo artifacts. Here's the overview for today. Um, we'll talk about artifacts in general. And as you know, we see artifacts in every single um, echo study that, that we read and that we obtain. And in fact, we see uh, artifacts in every single image. Now we may not pay attention to them and we may you know, overlook them, but today we're gonna refocus on them and really see what they are, tweeze them apart, find out why they occur and, and then talk, talk and think about how to get rid of them. So we'll start by looking at ultrasound fundamentals or the physics of ultrasound. We'll look at the velocity of ultrasound. That is, we'll look at speed artifacts. And not only will we look at the velocity of the ultrasound um, in and of itself, but we'll look at different propagation velocities in different media, different speeds in different media. We'll look at ultrasound and how it might create shadowing or attenuation. Um, we'll see how ultrasounds create new augmentation or enhancements to images. And once we understand these mechanisms, we'll be able to categorize the mechanism and actually put a label on the type of artifacts. Now these labels um, happen to all start with R, as you see here, the, the simplest one and the most intuitive one are called reflection artifacts. Um, and I'll, I'll show you nice illustrations about that. But reverberation, for example, is a type of reflection artifact. It's a multi-pathway reflection. Scatter is a reflection artifact. Side lobe artifacts are reflection artifact. And again, we'll, we'll run through examples of those. 
There's a real neat artifact that I like a lot called, called range ambiguity artifact. Um, now this has to do with pulse repetition frequency and with depth of imaging. And we see this on a regular basis. Then we have refraction artifact or the bending of sound waves or the bending of light. Uh, and we'll, we'll walk through that. And finally, resonance artifact, which is unique. It's not a reflection, but it's actually an oscillation. It's a, it's a, it's a ringing. And this, uh, the example that we'll show is, is called a ring down artifact. And finally, at the end, I'll show examples of electromagnetic interference uh, and some Doppler artifacts. So again, artifacts can create structures. They may or may not correspond to any anatomy. Now, they may actually correspond to anatomy. They may be different shape or different sizes. Um, we certainly don't want to um, block an image and the, the artifacts can fail to image uh, structures that are actually there. And as we all know, artifacts can lead to inaccurate diagnoses, inaccurate interpretations. And thus, we'd like to recognize them and by understanding the mechanism, avoid them. They come by various names, and the, and the names have changed over the years, over the decades. So I'll throw out a bunch of names, uh, old names, new names, and I'll use as many names as possible. They're all created by physical principles, so the, the physics of ultrasound, as well as the limitations of our technique. So they're, they're, they're created by the assumptions of our machines. And again, we'll talk about eliminating these by alternating imaging parameters, like changing the position of the transducer or of the patient, changing the depth or the frequency of the imaging. So let's start with this image. This is a transesophageal echo with the left atrium on the top. Of course, there's a left upper pulmonary vein and the ligament of Marshall that separates it from the left atrial uh, appendage. And the question is, what artifact is demonstrated in this everyday ordinary image? And here are the choices that I'll throw out there. Um, a, a mirror image artifact is present. B, attenuation artifact. C, reverberation artifact. D, a side lobe or E, all of the above. Now, before you jump to the answer, just think about it. We're gonna revisit this slide at the end after we walk through uh, all of these artifacts. So what is sound? This is a really neat um, picture uh, from 1950 uh, from Bell Telephone Laboratories, demonstrating the focusing using an acoustic lens on a sound that's emitted from a horn. Now, as we see here, this is very similar to an ultrasound probe, isn't it? You have this dense primary beam coming out of the middle that that with, a, with a near field and then down to a focal point, that's the narrowest length there, and then it expands out again. So we see less energetic beams coming out of the side. This is like our side lobes that come out of our transducer. And really interesting that we can actually visualize the constructive or the in-phase construction of the wave and the deconstructive interference that occurs that occurs when the waves cancel each other. A different way of illustrating sound waves is, is shown here. Let's start with the top, where there's a propagation of a sound wave starting from the left and going to the right. And what we see is the compression of this wave and the decompression, compression, decompression, or rarefaction is another name for decompression. And that creates the sound propagation as it goes from left to right. If we look at, at that in a different way, we look at that in terms of pressure, we can see there's a maximal pressure when the sound compresses. And then again, when you have that rarefaction, the sound is decompressing and one gets a negative or a minimal um, pressure. And this creates a, a nice sinusoidal wave. Now, this is what we're used to seeing, you know, this sinusoidal wave. And a couple definitions to look at. We see that one cycle length is, is the definition of a wavelength. The wavelength is, is shown very, very nicely there. We also know that these waves come in certain frequencies. 
And we happen to know a relationship between with wavelength and frequency, that wavelength times frequency equals velocity. And these, this velocity of sound changes depending on what medium the sound wave goes through. So for example, as sound goes through air, it's going at a speed of approximately 331 meters per second. Now the definition of ultrasound frequency is above of a frequency that's above 20,000 hertz or 20,000 cycles per second. In, in performing our diagnostic echo, we use frequencies of approximately two and a half to seven megahertz or millions of cycles per second. Now, again, here we see the transmission of, an, of a sound wave coming and hitting that, that box, which is a different substance. Now that box has a different impedance or resistance to the, to the, um, to the velocity and it sets up something called acoustic impedance mismatch. And when there's acoustic impedance mismatch, the instant sound comes, some of it is transmitted through the substance and some of it is reflected. And we always, we, we always need to have this impedance mismatch to, to get this reflection. Now here's a beautiful um, mountain with, with gorgeous snow on it being reflected beautifully in this flat, calm, smooth lake. Now, this is an example of reflection where there's an incident beam of light or of sound that comes down at a certain angle of theta, the angle of incidence. And this angle of theta, the angle of incidence equals to the angle of reflection. This is angle dependent, but it's frequency independent. So it doesn't matter what frequency of light or sound comes down the angle of incident is always going to be equal to the angle of reflection. Now this necessarily occurs at, if there is acoustic impedance, impedance mismatch. So there, there has to be a resistance and a change in the, in the medium. Specular reflection is shown here. It is when you have a large reflective surface that's smooth in nature and it's angle dependent. On the other hand, scatter, which is also a type of reflection, are usually very, very small surfaces that are probably less than the size of, uh, of a wavelength, rough in nature, and they're definitely frequency dependent. So specular reflection is frequency independent, it's just angle dependent, but scatter is frequency dependent. So again, an incident sound, hitting an impedance, some is transmitted, some is reflected. Another illustration of the uh, specular reflection comes in one direction. Um, the angles of theta are equal to each other. Here's some diffuse reflection scattering showing a rough surface where scattering occurs at low amplitudes in multiple directions. And again, specular reflection, the structure is greater than one wavelength, it's angle dependent, but independent of frequency. Here's scattering in which the, sub, the, subst, the substance is less than one wavelength in diameter. It's frequency dependent. And the way I like to think about that is I like to think about a high frequency wave hitting a small particle. And as lots of high frequency waves come down and hit the particle, it's hitting it from many, many different angles. So you get, you get more scatter with higher frequency waves. It's omnidirectional. And it explains, for example, why the sky is blue. It's frequency dependent. The frequency of blue light is scattered by our atmosphere and it causes the blue sky. So once again, another illustration of specular reflection off of smooth, flat surfaces, even if they're curved, and then scattered echoes off of very small surfaces. Now we can use this idea to our advantage when we're performing a transesophageal echo to rule out complex spontaneous echo contrast or thrombus information or even thrombus in the left atrial appendage, we, we want to actually have a lot of scatter so we can see the rouleauing of the red blood cells. We can see these very, very small particles. So we want to enhance the scattering. And how do we do this? We remember that uh, that scatter is frequent, uh, frequency dependent, that if the higher the frequency, the more the scatter. 
So what we want to do is adjust our, our settings to a higher frequency like 7 megahertz rather than 5, rather than 3 megahertz. And this will enhance our um, sensitivity to find complex spontaneous echo contrasts. So back to the idea of velocity, you know, sound has different velocities based on the medium that it's going through. And this is called propagation velocity. So we see various propagation velocities uh, in various media. In air, for example, 331 meters per second. If we march down the list then, we can see uh, various um, tissues and overall the soft tissue average is 1540 meters per second. Now, I think I remember this number being on our boards. 1540 meters per second is the propagation velocity average in soft tissue. All the way at the bottom, you see that bone has a very, very high propagation velocity, 3000 to 5000 meters per second. So again, the soft tissue average, 1540. You know, backing up to, to a previous thought, um, propagation velocity changes things. So here we have a source at a stable frequency. And we know that velocity equals frequency times wavelength. And so when it hits this border down below, you have increased impedance or increased resistance. It slows down the velocity. The propagation velocity is slower in the substance below. Well, if you have a slowing down of the velocity, velocity equals frequency times wavelength, and your frequency is, is stable, it's set, it's constant, then you have to have a decrease in your wavelength, which you see here. And you see a turning of the wave, a change in your wavelength, a change in the transmission angle. All right, with those concepts in mind, let's look at these two images. So on the left, we see a short axis image at the aortic valve. And on the right, there's an apical five chamber view. Now this is an image of a Star Edwards ball and cage aortic valve replacement. And a Star Edwards valve is a small silicone ball. It's not that small, but it's a silicone ball that's trapped in a Tweety Bird cage that goes up and down and it lets blood in like a, a, like, like a valve. Now, now these valves were, were only around between 1960 and 2007. Uh, they were made by Edward Life Sciences. And so um, they're starting to fade away. We're not seeing as many of them, but still uh, once in a while, uh, we certainly see these ball and cage valves. So the question is, why can't we see the ball? Why can't we visualize the ball? I don't see any round silicone ball in there at all. I do see some motion, but we don't see the ball. Here are the choices for you. The ball is round, and so we can't see it. The ball embolized, so we better be looking elsewhere for this ball. It melted because it's so old, and the blood was so warm, and it melted away. Or D, the frequency is too low. Those, those wavelengths are so long, they're just going right around the ball and not even, not even bouncing against the ball. Or E, the propagation velocity of the ball is slow. Think of the answer that you'd like to um, choose. And here is the, the answers that I have. There are two answers. We can't see the ball because the ball is round and because the propagation velocity of the ball is slow. Here's the explanation of, of those. We remember with specular reflection, the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So all of the ultrasound waves that come down and hit the ball, they bounce off at the same angle uh, of angle of incidence. And most, most of the ultrasound waves scatter away. We don't see them because they don't come back to the transducer. The only one we, we end up seeing, the only ones that's reflected is the one that comes straight smack down onto the ball in an orthogonal in an orthogonal way and hits that ball right on that dot. And some is transmitted and some is reflected. So the reflected dot comes back and the transducer will pick that one up. So we'll know where the, where the face of the ball is. Then again, some of that ultrasound wave gets transmitted through the silicone ball 
And because the propagation velocity is slower through silicon, it goes very, very, very slowly, slowly, slowly through the bowl, hitting the backside. Some is transmitted, some is reflected back. The reflected back comes back up through the bowl very, very, very slowly back to the transducer. Well, when that signal gets back to the machine, the machine's like, wow, that took a long time uh, for that back end of the bowl to show up because of the slow propagation velocity. And so that back of that ball must be really, really far away. So it actually creates this, this pulled out or this long or this oval ball shape um, because of a speed velocity artifact. Now we have to use our imaginations in this. And I helped us out a little bit by um, putting an oval on our machine or on our picture here. And we can sort of see this artifact. And again, just go with me on this that it looks like an oval, it's stretched out. And this is a speed velocity artifact due to the slow propagation velocity of the ball, of the silicone ball. And so those are the two reasons why can't, we can't see the ball. All right, moving on to attenuation. This is a word we use all the time, right? We use it sort of intrinsically. We're like, oh yeah, that's attenuated, that's attenuated. I wanted to make sure we, we knew exactly what this word meant. So attenuation means specifically the loss of energy. And in this case, the loss of sound energy as it passes through a medium. And this is due to overall four mechanisms. One, it's due to absorption. It's due to reflection, scattering, and refraction of the ultrasound beam. So it's just not one mechanism, the attenuation, but it's the loss of sound energy due to these four different mechanisms. Overall attenuation is frequency dependent. So the higher the frequency, the higher the attenuation. So absorption is frequency dependent. Um, a scattering is a type of reflection, that's frequency dependent. And we'll, we'll look later that refraction is also frequency dependent. So the higher frequency, the more the attenuation occurs. And attenuation is different in different media. Right, and that makes sense. So here's something, a list of the attenuation coefficients, which tell us how much energy loss, how much ultrasound loss we get as these ultrasound waves travel through these substances. We see that water hardly has any attenuation. There's hardly any loss at all of the signal. When we move down the line, blood is sort of like thick water with cells in it. So that's a little bit more attenuation. And then you get down to the tissues Bone has quite a bit of attenuation. Bone, you have quite a bit of energy loss as, as it goes through the bone. And then lung at the bottom, you have a lot of attenuation going out, a lot of energy loss, and it's hard to image through lung. So here's a classic attenuation artifact, the rib artifact. And you can see this vector coming down from the rib, moving down where a lot of, a lot of the ultrasound is getting attenuated. You can see through it though still, um, some of it is getting transmitted through the bone. Remember, the propagation velocity is very, very fast through bone. However, the attenuation coefficient is also very high. So you do get this uh, attenuation uh, artifact. But through something like a metal strut of a bioprosthetic mitral valve, you get almost a complete uh, uh, acoustic uh, shadowing attenuation artifact with almost complete signal loss behind the structure. And you, and you can't see the, the structures behind. Um, with those ideas in mind, let's look at this image. Uh, this is a subcostal view with a hepatic cyst at the top and then the liver, and then before it gets to the right heart structures. So we see this bright area that's posterior to the cyst. And on the left and right side of, of the cyst, it's just a, a more normal looking uh, liver, liver that's not as bright. So the question is, why is the liver so bright posterior to the cyst? A, the cyst is leaking like a lot of stuff, so it bounces off and it's enhancing that. B, well, we have increased attenuation of the cyst compared to liver. C, decreased attenuation of the cyst compared to the liver. D, reverberation artifact that comes down. Sometimes you see that. Or E, refraction artifact. 
So since we were just talking about attenuation, I'd probably pick one of those two, and I'd probably pick C because there's decreased attenuation of a cyst. So this is an example of an enhancement or an augmentation where it looks brighter, but in fact, you're not having as much energy loss as it goes through the water-filled cyst because the, in the, within the cyst, they have a very low attenuation coefficient, right? So you're not having as much energy loss. So it's brighter posterior, whereas the other ultrasound as it passes to the left and the right of the cyst starts attenuating right away through the liver. And so that looks darker. All right, here's, here's an example that we have all seen, especially when we look at micro bubble imaging. So they, always, they show us classically a four chamber apical view with all the fuzz over the, the apex. And they say, what's going on in the apex? And then often, most oftentimes, we give microbubbles and there's, there's apical dyskinesis and an LV apical thrombus or something like that. So what we do with, with this image and to get rid of that fuzz is, is give microbubbles. And that enhances the endocardial definition and the left ventricular um, uh, imaging. And um, then we see there's no thrombus. Well, what is this artifact called? This is a near field reflection artifact. It's a type of reflection artifact. Some of the literature calls it a bang artifact. Um, I, I haven't run across that term a lot, but it used to be called a bang artifact or near field artifact. And it occurs when there's strong acoustic signals that are close to the transducer. And this reflects back and forth off the transducer to form additional images. So there's two mirrors, in other words, there's the transducer face mirror and the, and the tissue mirror. They're very close. And the ultrasound bounces back and forth, bounces back and forth. And every time it returns to the transducer, it adds another layer or some, some fuzziness uh, until the energy runs out. We eliminate this by ma uh, malaligning our mirrors. So we can reposition the transducer so that it misaligns the mirrors so they can't bounce off of each other. Or giving microbubble contrast. Here's another artifact that we see, or this is an artifact we see with microbubble contrast. If we give the contrast too fast and we get a high density of contrast, then we see this attenuation behind it. And this attenuation occurs from two, two sources. One is scattering from the, from the dense microbubbles, and one is absorption from, from the microbubbles. All right, here's another. Um, Nice example that we've all seen before. It's a parasternal long axis with a highly mobile anteromitral leaflet, that's normal. And then we look in the far field a little bit toward the pleural effusion area, and we see this other linear thing. And we're like, wow, that looks awfully like a, um, an image of an anteromitral leaflet. At least it's coordinated in, this, in the same way. And so we think it's another mitral valve. What's the, what's the cause of this second mitral valve we see in the far field? A, is it refraction? B, might this be an example of a double outlet mitral valve? Or C, perhaps dextrocardia? D, is it a ring down artifact because it's down below the anterior mitral leaflet? E, is it a mirror image artifact? Or F, a comet tail artifact because it sort of looks like a tail, a wagging tail. And the answer, as you as you most most uh, recognize, this is a mirror image artifact. Here's the illustration of a mirror image artifact. A mirror image artifact is a multipath duplication artifact due to specular reflection. So it's the type of reflection artifact. We start on the left hand side of the illustration. We see the transducer sending down ultrasound, bouncing off the anteromitral leaflet or reflecting off of it and returning to the transducer. The uh, echo machine says, wow, well, I know the physics behind the ultrasound that I'm sending out. And I know it's took this amount of time to come back to me. Therefore, I know the distance. And it places the image at the, at the appropriate distance, demonstrating the mitral valve. However, there are other signals on the right-hand side of the image that miss the, the intramitral leaflet and hit like a far field structure 
that's smooth like a diaphragm, for example. And then these reflect off, and they may actually reflect back to the anteromitral leaflet and reflect down again. So they're sort of stuck in a way, or they're reflecting multiple times between the anteromitral leaflet and the diaphragm before they return all the way back to the transducer. And when the transducer receives it back, it's saying, oh, there's the anteromitral leaflet, but boy, did that take a long time. And so it places another uh, image of it as a mirror image in the far field because it took so long. So, and, and based on its physics, then it put it in the far field. So we get a mirror image artifact. Range ambiguity artifact, it has um, a similar idea in a sense. This occurs when there's a high pulse repetition frequency so that the depth is shallow, right? High PRF, shallow depth. And it's when a second pulse is sent out before the first signal is received back. And therefore the machine is unable to recognize, was that signal associated with the first or the second? And it misaligns it. it. It says, oh, must have been with the second, the one that I just sent out. It just came back already. But boy, that was quick. And so um, this results in a deep structure uh, appearing closer than the true location. And this deep structure can even be outside or deeper than the imaging sector. Now, this can be eliminated by changing the depth setting. And by changing the depth setting, we decrease the PRF. And so the pulses aren't sent out as fast and we can change that relationship of coming back. And we'll, well, I'll actually show you an, an example of this, um, but this is a really neat one. Okay, reverberation is another R word. This is another um, multipath reflector artifact. And we see a lot of reverberations all the time. This occurs when there is two or more highly reflective structures that cause bouncing of the ultrasound beam back and forth, causing bands of artifact to occur distant to the object. So here's a, here's a nice illustration of that. Bounces back and forth. Again, one of the mirrors is the transducer. The other is the object. And it keeps saying, wow, it's getting longer and longer and longer. And so there must be this same object further and further and further away. Here's a real life example. It's a mechanical mitral valve showing the reverberation artifact coming straight down through the left atrium all the way off of the image. This is a reverberation artifact, a multipath reflector artifact. This is another example of that comet tails, which come off of calcified atheromatous disease of the descending aorta. And again, this is a multipath reflection uh, artifact. Now back to our transducer. We saw a similar image earlier with the primary beam and the less energetic side lobes, but there's still ultrasound beams that are coming out, less, just less energetic. Well, these side lobes can also um, cause artifacts. And so here's a classic side lobe artifact, which is uh, generated by strong reflectors. Um, the reflector in this case uh, is outside of the visible sector. Once again, they're usually like this arcuate line that goes across the arc of the sector. That's that fuzziness, this is that so-called clutter artifact. And this is from the, the, the beams, the side lobe uh, beams. Now this is that example that's probably a range ambiguity artifact as well. It's putting it at the wrong location because of the range ambiguity. So therefore this one may disappear with a change in the angulation and again, it has to do with the reflector. You're changing the, the mirror uh, angle or change in the depth, this clutter artifact or side lobe artifact. So here's sort of a two-in-one um, artifact. Now, this is neat. We have these um, on the left-hand side, you see these two parallel dancing strands that are swaying like uh, synchronously. And they look like synchronous swimmers. How did how did they make that, or how does that happen? Is it a reflection artifact? Is it a reverberation because they're vibrating? You know, they're reverberating. Is it refraction? Is it resonance? Are they ringing? Or are they resonating together? Or are they comet tails? They look like tails, you know, wagging synchronously. So think about your answer. 
And the answer that I've come up with is refraction. This is an example of a refraction artifact. Here's an easy image that we all understand. There's one straw going in the water, the propagation velocity changes, right? And then there's two straws. We see, we see two parallel straws because of refraction. So refraction is the bending of the wave front as sound or, um, or ultrasound uh, passes through different media with different propagation velocities. So this is dependent not only on the propagation velocity of the medium, but it's also dependent on the frequency of the waves. And I'll, I'll show that again. So it's, this is dependent on the propagation velocity of the media and the frequency of the waves. And so this is how rainbows occur. It recurs by refraction. And that's why it splits out because it's, de it's dependent on the frequency, it splits out into the rainbow colors. Here's another illustration of that. This is using light waves where you have an actual fish and you have the bending of the light waves and it looks like you have an apparent fish and it may look like you have two, two fish. Looking at the physics of refraction, I think I put this in here to be complete and perhaps you'll see this again um, on a test perhaps. Uh, Snell's law is the definition of refraction. So the angle of the theta of incidence divided by the sine of the angle of the theta of, of the refraction. So the, the ratio of the sines of the angle corresponds to or is equal to the ratio of the velocities. Um, so again, that's just sort of extra for experts. Uh, you may or may not see that again. We think about that in a more intuitive way. Um, this is a really nice demonstration of a marching band, marching down from the top on a concrete parking lot, hitting a grassy field, and then marching into the grassy field. Now they're playing a tune with a set um, frequency. So the beat, the beat is set, the tempo is constant, the frequency is constant. So they're marching, marching to the beat. And as they come down at a certain velocity, they hit the grassy playing field. Well, walking in grass, the velocity decreases. They're, they're walking much more slowly. And remember that relationship, velocity equals frequency times wavelength. So the velocity slows down. The frequency, the tempo is the same, that's constant. So we have to, if the velocity decreases, then the wavelength decreases and they get closer. And by getting closer, they turn and that causes refraction. So it's the turning, of a wave as it goes through different uh, propagation velocities. And so here's that illustration once again, showing this a constant frequency from a source hits um, a slower propagation velocity, one with more impedance, and then the wave front decreases its, its wavelength and it actually turns. And so we, we see two of them, just like we saw two straws. Um, I, I also see this sometimes if I'm in an apical four chamber view and I'm looking at the RV free wall. Sometimes if it's right on the edge of the screen, um, I'll see a shifting like midway down the right ventricle, a shifting of it over and that's from a refraction artifact. All right, now resonance is something completely different. So let's not think of reflection. Resonance is the persistent oscillation of something that produces um, continued ultrasound signals. So this, for example, is, is, is a microbubble. And when we have the positive pressure, the microbubble you know, con contracts. And then during a negative pressure, it expands. And you get this oscillation, this second harmonic uh, nonlinear response, this resonance of this microbubble. And it actually causes uh, an ultrasound signal. So again, it's not a reflection, but it's a resonance. And this, uh, the example is, is called a ring down artifact. So the ring down artifact is a ringing or a resonance or like a ringing of a bell, um, which is produced when an air bubble or a cholesterol crystal resonates at an ultrasound frequency and gives off sound. The system believes the sound is coming from deeper in the body. So here's an example in the liver of a ring down artifact from air bubbles. Now this does look like a comet tail, which remember, that's, that's a resonance. 
but this is ring down. Um, it is it's a it is not a, a multipath reflector. So it's, this isn't a, this isn't a reverberation. I may have said that wrong. This is resonance. It's not a reverberation artifact. Okay. And uh, finally, here's some examples of electromagnetic interference. Um, and, you know, our, our ultrasound um, processing is susceptible to contamination by strong uh, electromagnetic signals like the bovi in, in the OR. And we simply have to wait till they're done with the bovi and or figure out uh, what, you know, electronics is interfering um, with our signal. There's nothing wrong with the transducer or the machine. There's two examples of Doppler artifact, which we won't talk much about. One is uh, spectral blooming or widening artifact of this spectral Doppler. And one is mislabeling of tissue Doppler, where you just see the color palette is all over the place. There's a lot of mosaic sort of coloring, coloration going on. Okay, so let's revisit our initial image that we started with, our transesophageal echo. We're looking at the left upper pulmonary vein, the ligament marshal, the left, uh, left atrial appendage, and the mitral valve. What artifact is seen here? Mirror image, attenuation artifact, reverberation artifact, side lobe or all, and all, the right answer is almost always all. Mirror image, we see the tip of the ligament of Marshall, the Q-tip sign. We see the tip of it uh, equidistant down uh, below the ligament of Marshall from the transducer. So that's the mirror image artifact. We see attenuation coming from that tip of that Q-tip coming down. We see loss of energy, also loss of energy, probably from the mitral annular calcification. Um, reverberation artifact, that's that reverberation coming down. Uh, that's that multipath reflector, again, coming down from those two, from the ligament of Marshall and from the mitral annular calcification. And then finally, side lobe artifact, which is coming sort of as an arc off of the ligament of Marshall to, to the left. And those are from side lobe uh, ultrasounds. So we see a whole bunch, and this is normal. You see a whole bunch of artifacts in every single image that we take. So in summary, um, artifacts can be explained by knowing about ultrasound physics and the properties and propagation velocities and acoustic impedance mismatch and all those techniques we talked about. Um, by understanding the mechanisms, we can, we can create corrective measures um, so that we can help them to disappear so that we can see the actual anatomy and, and have more accuracy in our reads. So thank you uh, very much for your time. And at this point, I think um, we are ready uh, for questions. Okay, thank you very much. And at this time, we will begin the Q&A session. From IAC, I'd like to introduce Katie Gibson, Director of Accreditation for Echocardiography, who will assist with the Q&A session today. Katie, would you like to start us off? Absolutely. Thanks, Kelly. Um, first, I want to thank you, Dr. Lauer, for your time, um, that excellent presentation. I really appreciate how you uh, seem to love physics so much and you mm -hmm. make, it, make it fun and um, definitely relatable. And I also want to thank ASC, our sponsors today. Uh, we have a lot of really good questions, so let's go ahead and dive right in. So um, the, we have a couple of questions asking about the difference between a ring down artifact versus a comet tail artifact. Do you have any uh, yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I've 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 thought of, they look very very similar, and um, you know, when it boils down to it. I think when I'm when I'm looking at things, I don't know if it really matters. The mechanisms, though, are completely different. So a ring down artifact, and the way I remember ring down, and if this is a question on on the boards, for example, ringing of a bell, and a bell resonates, so it oscillates, it goes back and forth. So a ring down artifact comes from the air bubble itself or the crystal itself that oscillates and it, it actually creates the ultrasound wave. It's not a reflector, but the source of it is the crystal or the bubble itself. 
So that's a resonant artifact. But a comet tail um, is, is a, is a multi-path reflector. So it bounces, it bounces back and forth. Um, I, I, I have, even when I was, was putting those slides together, I remember seeing different sources and I did see some variability um, in them that, that they weren't always um, right on. And sometimes in one source, you saw it called one thing and sometimes in the other. I think it's just, for me, it's just, most interesting to know that they're two different mechanisms, but they actually might look the same. They might look the same. I see. Okay. Gotcha. And could you explain what side lobe gating is? Side lobe gating? Yes. <laughs> is this a trick question? It could Did... be. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. I don't, I don't, I'm not familiar with gating, um, mm -hmm. side lobe gating. So, you know, the side lobes, my, my understanding about that, the way I think about side lobe artifacts are that um, these are artifacts that are, that occur from the ultrasound waves that aren't in the primary beam. So there's these, there's these scattered waves that go down and they react in similar fashions. They reflect and they, you know, and they have um, um, the multipath reflection, and and they cause they cause different artifacts, um, and so they they cause that range ambiguity artifact as well. And, and I'm not sure if that's the genesis of the question. Is that one example where um, I think that there were side lobes? ultrasound source that caused the range ambiguity artifact because they went down and they reflected off of uh, a, a reflector that was very, very far away. And they came back and it misregistered it and it linked it with a, with a, with a sooner uh, ultrasound. That may be the gating part of it, um, but I'm not familiar necessarily with that, with that term. Yeah. Um... It was a good question, and I think that was still a very good answer. <laughs> okay. Um, I hope wait, it was do, the answer. Yeah, definitely. I, there are a lot of people who are still just a little bit confused about mirror image artifact. Could you briefly go cover that again? Yeah, yeah. You know, when I think about that and when I try to explain it, um, I have to simplify it in my mind. I think these systems are very, very complicated, and with transmission and reflection going on everywhere, I have to make it as simple in my mind as possible. So the first half of that is easy, right? That's the, the one, the, the, um, the ultrasound waves that, that reflect directly off of the anterior mitral leaflet. And that comes back and then the machines know where to put it based on the, the time frame. The second part of it, the mirror image, is a little bit more difficult. And I've even thought through this multiple times and thought about different mechanisms. So some of that thinking is that the ultrasound waves can be transmitted through the, the anteromitral leaflet, and they can be transmitted through the whole darn, the whole darn image. But it has to do with the, the way the mirror image um, forms itself. It has to do with a multipath reflection. So there necessarily has to be two mirrors somewhere very, very deep where you ha have just the right setup, the right angulation so that the ultrasound waves bounce back and forth off of these two mirrors that are distant. So in this example, it was a flat diaphragm bouncing off the backside of the mirror of the antromitral leaflet. And it kept bouncing, bouncing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then somehow all of these images escaped and they got back to the transducer. That, you know, that that honestly is the part that gets me as well, is like, how, how does this come back all, all in one package? Um, so it it does, it makes it there. And then for, for some reason, the machine says, wow, did that take a long time? And then it, it, it says it took such a long time um, to get the backside of the mitral leaflet, then it must show up very, very distance away. And it puts it distance away as a mirror image, as the backside of, of the um, anterior mitral leaflet. And I think it just happens to be 
the way that the mirrors are arranged and that the way the ultrasound vector, you know, comes out and transmits itself. I think it's just the alignment of all the planets, you know, perfectly. And then it, it just happens in that, in that manner. But yeah, I can't, I can't, when I, when I think about mirror image, I can't overthink it. Um, be, because then it, it, it does get me mixed up. Well, I, I appreciate that as well, because I think that I tried to stump you by reading the question wrong. So the question was actually, what's the difference between side lobe and grading lobe artifacts? Oh, you stumped me. Okay. Um, side lobe and what was the second one? Grating lobe. Grating lobe? Yeah. You stumped me. I stumped you again. <laughs> All right. Something for, for me to look up, too. Okay. Yeah, something for me to look up. Yeah. Great. Moving, <laughs> moving on to uh, yeah, something me. else now. So there's this is a nice thought-provoking question. Um, the With the rule of thumb, usually people will say, if you don't see it more than in more than one view, then it is most likely an, most likely an artifact. What are your thoughts on that? If you don't see it in more than one view, yeah. So that that has everything to do um, with the with setting up the mirrors and having the ref reflection artifacts. So when we think of when I think of artifacts, my mind automatically goes to I guess two primary ones. One is a reflection artifact or a multipath reflection artifact, like a re like a um, like a reverberation artifact and so if we misalign the mirrors then that that you know eliminates the artifact so i agree if if you move to a different view and the artifact goes away and you move to a different view and the artifact goes away then it's probably an artifact the other one that i uh, we try to do that with is attenuation artifact where a substance is attenuating or reducing the the energy level um then obviously, if you move, try to get around that attenuator and you see it from a different angle, from the left, right, or from the below, um, and you get rid of that attenuation. Um, so yeah, those are, those are that's one of the primary ways to try to get rid of um, artifact. And it works in, in multiple different etiologies, you know, multiple different mechanisms. Thank you. Um, do you have any tips on how to uh, get rid of attenuation or, or decrease attenuation artifact with using um, micro bubbles or uh, ultrasound enhancing agents? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a that's a good one. Um, you know, oftentimes, and I've I've thought about this as well, and and haven't researched it, but here's. I'll give you an answer and see if this works. So yes, so I I use micro bubbles a lot in in several different cases. One is to outline, you know, M, uh, thrombus, for example. Um, but it does it does get rid of um, um, reverberation artifacts. In terms of attenuators, it may actually overpower the oscillation of it and the scatter and the reflection of it may actually overpower the um, the loss. So what you're what you, what you're really doing is you're causing an enhancement of the ultrasound um, that negates the the loss or the attenuation of the sound waves. So in that way, um, you know, you can certainly use one mechanism over the other, and you can use the micro bubble oscillations and and um, to give off ultrasound waves. Can you give another brief explanation about reverberation artifact? We have a few questions about that as well. Yeah. Um, Reverberation. So that's a that's a multi-path uh, reflector. So again, you have two mirrors. I've read this in two different ways. I'll I'll be honest with you. I've read it in two different ways. I've I've read it that and, and what happens is you you have two reflectors. 
prim- in a in a simple simple sense two mirrors and again part of the ultrasound wave is transmitted and some is reflected so some of, let's just say you have um a piece of calcium um like microannual calcification and you have the transducer it sends down a wave it hits the calcium it bounces back and most of that wave is picked up by the transducer and it says oh i know where that is i'll put a piece there that's where the mac is but some of it gets reflected off of the transducer head or off of the tissue that's you know high up in the near field and it gets reflected back down and then part of that gets transmitted and part of it gets reflected off of the mitral annular calcification and gets sent back. And the second one that gets sent back, it then the machine says, wow, I got another piece of Mac, but that took further, that took more time. So it must be further away, farther away. So it puts another little piece down. And then it keeps doing that back and forth. And again, it, it all has to do with how much energy, how much frequency is used. And it just puts down more and more and more um, images that go all the way off the screen because this this bouncing of the ultrasound keeps going back and forth. Um, I've also read explanations that if you have a crystal of, of calcium, for example, that you can have internal, you can have internal this micro um, multipath. You can have the ultrasound waves going up and down, hitting the backside and the front side and the backside and the front side of this of this crystal. And in that way, it it seems like, and as these, some of them get transmitted back and some of them get reflected, the ones that keep getting transmitted back, it shows that it takes more and more time and, and thus it puts the image farther and farther out. So I hope that explanation helps. I think that's a great explanation. Um, we have a couple of questions on what techniques can help with um, avoiding re- refraction artifacts or if mm-hmm. you can get rid of them. Yeah, neat. So um, sometimes you can't. Um, refraction is pretty cool. It necessarily means you're going through two different media, right? And with two different propagation velocities. And um, so what you have to do again is is either change the frequency so that it doesn't curve as much or somehow not image, try try not imaging through the substance. So water tends to give us this this refraction. Um, So when we image through lungs or pleural effusion or sometimes pericardial effusions, we we get this. Um, Those don't bother me so much, to be quite honest, because as I mentioned before, you simply see a shift in the plane and then you see this misalignment going on or you see two of something and it, it doesn't change my diagnosis at all or it doesn't it doesn't bother me but i guess what we need to try to do as someone mentioned earlier as the other question mentioned is try to image the the whatever you're imaging from a different angle you know and try not to go through liquid uh like pleural effusions or pericardial effusions or any kind of fusions and just try to look at it from a different angle i think that's that's what i would try Great suggestions. And I think we have time for one more question. So if you're not sure if you're looking at an artifact or an abnormality, what are some mm-hmm. ways, tried and true ways to tell the difference between the two? Um, mm-hmm. you, yeah. Yeah, That's great question. question. So we, you know, we think of these issues all the time. Uh, I think of them all the time when we're looking at thrombus. And so we mentioned a bunch of answers already. I would always, always start with changing the transducer angle. You can change it, the angle in the same position, just like move, just like angle it to the left or right or up or down. And that might be enough to, to get rid of an artifact. You can change the position of the transducer a little bit. Try to think about, you know, five different ways to image the aortic valve we can image the aortic valve from lots and lots of different 
spaces and directions. Um, and then Microbubble um, is also a, a great way that eliminates quite a number of, of artifacts. And so even when we're looking and we're, we're um, wondering about, um, you know, if we're wondering about a thrombus in the left atrial appendage, we can give microbubbles and that will outline it. Um, we can change the frequency. So if we see too much scatter going on, we can try to decrease the frequency that we're looking at. Or with, with range ambiguity, you know, try to change the depth. So any of those things, just thinking about how to change the physics parameters and how to change the parameters that your echo machine is, is thinking about. Thank you so much for that. That was such a great question and answer session. Um, thank you for everybody who submitted questions. I'm going to go ahead and turn it back to Kelly, who is going to give us some information on how to get your credits. So thank you again, Dr. Lauer. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you very much, Katie. And thanks again, everyone. And a very special thank you to Dr. Lauer for this presentation today. Please feel free to contact IAC with any questions that were not answered during the Q&A session. To receive continuing education credit for attending this webinar, please complete the survey. The link to the survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of this live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. On the left side of the My Accounts page, you'll click on Webinars, look for the title of this session, Fundamentals of Echo Artifacts. Beneath this title, you will click Review Event. On the left, select the Evaluations tab, then click Take Evaluation to complete the survey. Your certificate can then be accessed and printed from the very next screen and any time thereafter through the CE Transcript section on the My Account page. If you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at webinars at intersocietal.org. Once again, we thank you for joining us today and appreciate your participation.